Hey there, everybody. Kirk Spano. Going to go for a walk today with you. First time uh, doing the walk around. Uh, this is where we're staying. A friend's house, complete with pretty girls in the hot tub already. I like that I said that. We're going to go find the walking path. We're going to talk about um, geopolitical events, Bitcoin, gold, the dollar. I'm uh, really going to echo some of the things that a subscriber brought up uh, from a video with a uh, or Raul Paul, and I don't agree with him on everything, but I, I, I do think that we ended up in a lot of the same spaces. So in the video that's posted in the Margin of Safety Investing chat room, uh, Raul talks about three scenarios in the Ukraine, and these are basically the three scenarios that I talked about two or three weeks ago. I'd have to take a look at where the article was published, but the article was that in a month, Ukraine won't matter to the stock market and really the things that we've been talking about, which is the Federal Reserve and the economy slowing down a little bit, uh, would be the things that mattered. Now, this is the neighborhood I'm staying in. I don't know if you can kind of take a look here. This is in uh, Chandler, Arizona, Leighton Lakes area. Um, you know, being from Wisconsin, I wouldn't really call these lakes. They're kind of like spillages. So, you know, you might be able to get a, a pontoon boat out on there if you paddle it. But uh, yeah, not really a lake, but you know, they like it. Um, a lot of mountains, a lot of fake grass. So I did not know this industry had taken off a lot of fake grass. In any case, three scenarios of the Ukraine. And, and not to make light of this, you know, I, I've been very anti Putin for a long time. Not a big fan of Chi over in China. I've told people sell your commie stocks for two and a half, three years now. And selling your commie stocks, when I told you, sell your commie stocks would have been the right thing to do. They're down 60, 70, 80%. And how many of us really want to invest in China at this point, given what we see the sanctions on Russia are? What if we start walling off China because we can't resolve the Taiwan issue? I don't see that as likely. I think there will be a resolution on Taiwan that uh, stops way short of what happened with Ukraine. I don't see this emboldening China at all uh, to go into Taiwan. But the three scenarios of Ukraine are some sort of resolution where the dump truck comes by and uh, we'll just hold on here for a second so it's not too loud. No, we're not gonna be able to avoid this. Gotta get the work done. So scenario one is uh, my highest probability scenario. It was uh, Rawls second. So the high probability scenario that I see is that there is some sort of resolution in the Ukraine uh, that involves the government staying in place, most of the country staying together, um, a corridor on the east in the uh, disputed areas, ending up with Russia or ending up independent. And Ukraine will not join NATO. I don't think now or ever. I think that if NATO really wanted them in, they would have protected them. It's clear that over 20 years, and especially since 2014, not having NATO uh, membership, it was deliberate. And there's no doubt that we could have included them and, and fast-tracked them, and we didn't. And we've known for a long time, the West has known for a long time, that Ukraine was a, a standout region for Russia and Putin. You know, they really are about as Russian Slavic as you're going to get in the region. So the number one scenario is that kind of sort of neutral state where if Ukraine can work this out, uh, they'll end up being a member of the EU, but also have free trade with Russia. And they can be the pass-through between the West uh, and, and Russia. So whether sanctions stay on or not, if Ukraine kind of gets a pass and they're allowed to transact with both sides, now all of a sudden you have a country that becomes pretty wealthy and they will have to protect themselves in case a new Russian oligarch decides, well, I guess we'd really do want it. Um, but I don't see that happening. The reason why the number two scenario, which is Russia takes over the Ukraine uh, and really has to partially occupy it, put in an, uh, a puppet government, it's not likely because the estimates are 300 to 500,000 police and troops it would take to occupy that country. You know, there's still, even after the uh, people who left, the refugees who left, there's still around 11, 12 million people there. You know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of occupation. 
And we saw what happened with the United States and Russia, both in Afghanistan. It's just hard to do. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time, money, lives. Raul put that as his highest likelihood. I actually see that as the lowest likelihood. An occupation, takeover by Russia, least likely thing to happen. Uh, the third scenario was World War III, where something bad happens between NATO and Russia. Uh, maybe the, the jets from Poland that ended up getting blocked by the Pentagon. Um, and, and really ask yourself, why? Why did they block that? The answer is, is they really don't want to protect Ukraine. That's the bottom line. So I think if we overstep, if we do something wrong, if Russia just feels that they have no choice, that they're backed into a corner, you know, I think World War III is as likely as Russia taking over Ukraine. I put those both at probably 10 percentage. I think it's 80 percent likely that there's just some sort of resolution with Ukraine that allows Putin to say, hey, I demilitarized Ukraine like I said I would, and they're not going to become a member of NATO like I said, and we're still going to be able to do business with them. And I think those relationships get repaired over a long period of time just because they're, you know, not quite a homogenous people, but, you know, they're Slavic and they all relate to each other. So I think, you know, we saw Bosnia, Croatia, and uh, some of the other countries over there that broke up, they're all working together again, too. So time fixes a lot of things. Here we are at the park find a uh, spot to sit down here for a second. Just walked about a mile. Maybe not quite a mile. I bet it's about a mile. Pretty good for an old man like me. Trying to work up to uh, four or five miles a day. Be walking the uh, Chihuahua. So uh, he's only got about a mile in him per day. His short little legs, you know. So if the most likely thing to happen is that the Ukraine and Russia work something out, just leave it at they work something out. Uh, even if Russia gets part of the eastern part of the country, uh, that really diffuses all the risks that people are worried about with Ukraine. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, I, I just don't think Ukraine matters much in the scope of global economy or global markets. And I think the Federal Reserve, the other central banks in Europe in particular, now they become the linchpin. What's going to happen next? So if Ukraine doesn't have the great harvest and planting season that Raul talks about, which is something I talked about last week when I talked about fertilizer companies, you know, why we're in Nutrien. You know, years ago, I talked about this sort of thing happening. I said, you know, one of the big things with fertilizer is that a lot of it comes from Ukraine. Your colleague is the name of the company. And if that ever gets jammed up, which, again, I was talking about it way back when we bought Nutrien after Potash Corp merged with Agrium, Nutrien can go to 100. So how many of you believe me four years ago when Nutrien was $27, $28, $29 a share, I said, it's going to go to 100, might go to 200. Well, here we are three, four years later, about four years later, and the stock has more than tripled. It's around $100 a share right now. And the question becomes, what do you do with it if you bought it back when I said to buy it? Well, the answer is you probably sell a little bit, or write a covered call, uh, or a little bit of both, but you probably for sure are keeping your core position. So if you invested ten thousand dollars and it's worth thirty-five right now, you know maybe you take a third of that off the table, right? Your original investment, take it off the table. Now everything that you have left is a free roll. And if you'd like to generate some income, maybe against half of what's there, you sell a four, five, or six-month dated call, covered call, something that's out there that will get a lot of time value on the premium. And if it gets called away, if it goes up 10 or 20%, it gets called away later this year. So what? When it comes down, again, just write a catch to your put, you rinse and repeat, and you just keep doing it until it's put back to you. You know, that's the, the process that we've had on a lot of these stocks. Now, under the category of letting no crisis go to waste, what did President uh, Bush, excuse me, President Biden talk about last week? He basically said we need to get off of Russian energy and fossil fuels in general. I don't know how much stronger I can make this. When the president of the United States, it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, if it's George W. Bush saying we need to get more of our own oil, fracking happen. If it's Barack Obama at the end of February 2009 saying if I could buy stocks, I would buy stocks, right? That, that marked the bottom of the market two weeks later. 
if it's President Biden saying, hey, we need to really double down on clean energy, I think you probably ought to really double down on clean energy, or at least cleaner energy. So Ametis, which is one of our stocks, had their earnings call yesterday, and it was pretty interesting. Everything that they have talked about for a year that I've been talking to you about um, is happening. Here's some math for you. The contracts that they have in place with Delta and American and Japan Airlines and the deal that they did with was either Pilot or um, uh, Travel America. I'm not really sure which. I'm going to do the research when I get back in town to see if I can match up the press releases, see who they're selling to all of this uh, uh, RNG and uh, diesel to. But they're talking about having $5 billion in revenues by 2026. Their contracts are already over $6 billion. This company is not only going to double their estimates, but I think they're going to come close to tripling their estimates. And that's if things in India don't go great. Uh, if things in India go great, you know, they own the biggest biodiesel refiner, uh, refinery out there. And there's just a law passed that they have to use biofuels. You know, they could beat their current estimate deck, their current five-year plan by 5x. You know, imagine if this company has 10 or $12 billion a year in revenue or $15 billion a year in revenue because India goes well. You know, now all of a sudden you've got a company with what, 33 million shares outstanding. You know, you break that down, you know, at 15 billion in revenues, uh, you're probably looking at four to 5 billion of profit to the bottom line. You know, let's, let's take that across the line to the bottom. It's a huge number. This all of a sudden could become three, four, five hundred dollars stock. You know, it's 14 right now. So if you don't have a Metis, you're just missing the whole energy uh, transition situation here. Not only are we going to get more solar and, and distributed solar and microgrids and battery systems and utilities that are getting in there uh, to fortify the system, but there are certain things that have to have liquid fuel. And eventually, I think a lot of it's hydrogen for, for heavy, uh, heavy uh, transportation. But in the next 10, 20 years, maybe in 30 years, you're going to have carbon capture solutions and, and carbon mitigation solutions um, that are leading the way. Chevron just bought a renewable energy group up in Iowa, which was a $3 billion transaction. Uh, Ametis is looking like it's going to be three to five times bigger than that at some point, you know, four or five years out. Yeah, I, just, I just can't stress enough to you that you need to buy the dips on Ametis and you should get them. Because over the course of this year, there is a short argument on Ametis that it's got some legitimacy, but the estimates that Ametis uses are below the estimates that the short sellers use. So there's a narrative there, but the numbers don't work. So ultimately, even if the tax subsidies uh, go down a little bit, Ametis has already got that factored into their system. In fact, they're using tax uh, uh, breaks and incentives that are far lower than what, you know, than what's out there now. Well, what if for the next five or 10 years, we actually have very high tax subsidies, you know, to get into clean energy? Well, in that case, then they're even higher margin uh, company than, than what they're telling you they're going to be. So I don't think the short arguments on Ametis are very strong, but I do think given that it's a young company uh, in an emerging industry, even with the backing of government, right? Our, our four-step uh, process, what is the secular trend? Clearly towards cleaner energy. Uh, what is government policy? Clearly to support cleaner energy. So, you know, now you get down to the basics of the company is, you know, how are they financially? And we've talked about how they finance the company. They're in great shape. So now it's just a matter of when does the market start to love them? When does it become um, a technical story on the trade side? You know, we're getting close is the answer. Uh, uh, we don't know if that breakout comes this quarter, next year, next quarter, or early next year. My, be my bet would be early next year. So you have the rest of the year to sell puts on a Metis, build a position. I am going to make it a full position imminently. Um, probably the next time it drops down to 13 or 11, I'm going to add. Uh, it could go down to seven or nine, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, on just general market bad news. So, you know, keep some, some powder in reserve. But I'm so sure about Metis. Um, 
it would take a lot for that company to screw up. I mean, they have all the connections in California. The India, the India plant is completely unvalued by the by the public. Completely unvalued. There's a lot of parts of this company that the market doesn't value, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for things that the market doesn't value today that they will value tomorrow. Ametis has got that like four different things: um, carbon capture, carbon sequestration. Um, you know, the renewable uh, natural gas, uh, the biodiesel, the jet fuel, you know, just the jet fuel in India are, are probably worth, you know, probably three billion at least, if not four or five billion. So that's, you know, that puts them on par with renewable uh, energy groups just got bought by Chevron. Uh, interestingly, there's a couple of Chevron uh, former execs on the board of Ametis. Uh, so I'd be looking at that. All right, so let's go back to geopolitical uh, offshoot in a different direction. So we know that the transition to cleaner energy is going to happen. Uh, Europe's going to push it really hard. They're probably going to have to do more QE to support that. We're all talked about that too. So Europe will mobilize to really push renewable energy to not have to rely on Russia, right? It just makes sense. They said they're going to do it. They want to not rely on Russia by 2027. That was down. That's down in the last couple of days from the original 2030 that I talked about. So for them to replace that much natural gas, uh, you know, that's going to be a big endeavor. So you're going to see a lot of money going into companies like Total Energies and all of their clean energy solutions. Uh, you know, if, if I was going to own an oil major, it would be Total. Uh, I'm not going to own an oil major. I'll just own Sun Power and then the basket of clean energy stocks or a couple of baskets of clean energy stocks. Uh, but Europe's going to do that. And as Europe supports that development, um, the, the euro probably goes down relative to the dollar. And one thing I've been telling you for 10 years now, I've been a bull on the dollar, is there really is just no alternative to the dollar, not, not even Bitcoin. And we'll get there in a second too. But the dollar is the currency that has to underpin uh, global growth development. Uh, it's not going to be China because nobody trusts them. Uh, if people trusted China, if China became democrat, more democratic, and more free, uh, you know, they really would be a rival to the United States, even without uh, great resources. But they can't get out of their own way, right? They they are developing at a pace that was necessary to prevent a revolution. That's how fast they're growing. But that's coming down. And now you're seeing discontent again. So one of the things that I've said over time is, you know, you don't want a billion cold, hungry Chinese. That'd be bad for the world. Same thing in India. And uh, because of basically religion and philosophy, India is less militant than Chinese. Um, but that's still, what, two and a half billion, just a third of the people on the planet in those two countries. So my, I think it might be 40%. You have to consider from the policy standpoint, what does the United States do through economics to prevent a big war? Well, one of the things is, you know, Nixon goes to China and helps China develop. Those sorts of things have to continue to happen. The United States cannot wall themselves off. If we allow globalization to die uh, completely, you know, and technology uh, allows you to do it partially and geopolitics gets in the way uh, because everybody wants to show that they have the biggest swing and checkbook. You know, you have to be careful. When the, when the world, and you go back to World War I, especially World War II, but when the world becomes less globalized, when we're talking to each other less, when we're trading with each other less, it becomes more dangerous. The whole America First thing, you know, I'm in Arizona, and there's a bank or something down here called America First. You know, they changed their name. And, and, and that just has such huge negative connotations. When you look at history, you say, well, America first, that's the way it should be. Well, not if you look at the history. If you look at the history of that, it's fashion. And do we really want to go in that direction? So as voters, as investors, we have to not only vote with our vote, but we have to vote with our money. And we cannot say we want to deglobalize. Now, we can say we want enough supply chain here that we're never vulnerable. But if you say, hey, we just want to, just island America. It won't work. We will end up in a massive world war at some point if that is the way things go for the next generation or two. So the millennials are going to have to decide how do we get along with the rest of the world? How do we become less predatory? Well, part of that is Bitcoin. 
And I can't see how Bitcoin isn't worth, you know, I've done the, the back of the napkin math and it's hard to do because there's just so many unknowns. But my back of the napkin math isn't that Bitcoin goes to 100,000. My back of the napkin math is that Bitcoin goes to between 300,000 and 500,000 this decade. So you really ought to own some Bitcoin and stop saying, well, I don't understand it. I don't care if you don't understand, just buy it, just buy it. Get into a dollar cost averaging program, whatever you can afford, a percentage of your bank savings. So if you've got a hundred grand in the bank, put 10 grand in the Bitcoin, 10 grand into Ethereum, and then dollar cost average in 500 or a thousand dollars a month. You've got 10,000 in the bank. You just knock a zero off. Make sure you got 10 grand in the bank before you're buying Bitcoin and Ethereum though. You know, you gotta, you gotta have your cushion. And, you know, and I'm not talking credit card cushion. Credit card limits can go away quickly in a, in a financial crisis. So you do want to always have cash on hand. Um, you know, probably I, I keep a couple bucks in cash at the house in a safe. So not talking, you know, James Bond levels of cash, but, you know, you should have enough, you should have enough cash in a vault easily accessible in case you've got to disappear for two or three weeks, you know, go up to that cabin in the woods and, you know, pick up your, uh, your, your hidden stash of beans and, and rice and, uh, and toilet paper. But, you know, for Bitcoin, there's just no way that it doesn't go up. I mean, what we're seeing in a world where geopolitics uh, are a little tougher as the planet gets more developed, as easy growth is going away, you just have to have those cushions. Well, Bitcoin allows for transactions between people, country to country, very easily. I think that this incident, if nothing else, cements the place of Bitcoin in the global economy. I think this was it. Um, and I think that that's partially why Russia did it. Russia wanted to devalue the dollar and wanted to make the dollar less strong. At a certain level, it will do that. Fewer transactions will take place in dollars, but you're not going to see more in yuan. You're not going to see more in rubles. You're not going to see more in rupee, really. You're probably not even going to see more in, 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 in euro. So where do the transactions go? It's going to still be the dollar, but for transfers of big sums of money or for storing value, I think Bitcoin is going to be an important thing. Um, it's, it's basically going to be money gram without all the fees. I mean, think about that. You know, we send money in big hunks using money gram and used to be Western union. Uh, still, I think Western union is still doing it, but the transfer fees were massive, right? So now you can do it with Bitcoin for almost zero. And that's, you know, that's important. So they've wiped out the money gram Western Union industry, or they are about, and companies like PayPal and Square are going to take their place, and other companies around the world are going to take the place as intermediaries with the regulations coming out that are basically going to say, look, if you sell your currency, then what's going to happen is if you sell your cryptocurrency, it's a taxable event. So you're not going to see a ton of transactions, right? You're not going to go and buy your pizza and your bubble gum and your gasoline with Bitcoin. Because every single time it's a taxable transaction, so that's how they're going to they're going to regulate it is as a commodity, as a security uh, that falls under those types of capital gains taxation rules. That makes it very difficult to use for day to day transactions. But when you're moving a hunk of money, a big hunk of money, it works. So that's going to be where Bitcoin goes to. Family offices are just starting to buy it. That's hugely important. I've talked to you about family offices over and over and over again, and. Ethereum is going to be the backbone of digital contracts. I, I just can't see them getting replaced there. There's a few that might. And I think a lot of the tokens that are on top of Ethereum get folded in. So we'll see who the winners are, who the developers pick, who, the, who people vote for with their dollars, you know, which projects do they go to. And ultimately, I think Ethereum ends up being the backbone. And a lot of these other tokens, I don't know exactly how the technology will work, but I think it's ultimately everything will just be in in ether and you know you'll just say this is what i wanted to do and the system will know this is how you do it because all those functionalities will just eventually get folded into a giant ethereum network all right last let's finish off with gold so back when i said that we were on the verge of a big gold market a gold bull market right i started buying gold in 2018 accelerated in 2019 and as is what I do, um, I don't talk a lot what I'm 
buying very much except with you. You know, I don't put it out there in the in the bigger media until I've kind of accumulated what I want to accumulate. So in what was it January of 2020, I talked about the giant bull market in gold and the gold bullion would go up to about three thousand dollars, could go to five, but I think three thousand is the is the best target. And that at some point the gold stocks would be uh, in the cycle, the gold stocks would be a good deal. In other parts of the cycle, gold would be a good deal. Now, I'm not a big fan of owning gold security. I think that you can trade them. If you're going to trade options on them, get in there with Shooter and, and trade gold with Shooter because he just eats up that volatility. He makes money almost every damn time. Yeah, I, I've been watching what he's doing. I call, I call him on vacation You know, a couple days ago. I was just like, man, I just watched this last uh, cryptocurrency webinar that you did. I mean, holy cow, was that good? You know, if you're not on the 199 service, you know, there's a dollar ninety nine a month to use this our, our paid service on YouTube. And I'm going to kind of tighten up the way it looks uh, when I get back. But man, if you haven't uh, subscribed for $1.99, that video that Shooter did the other day on cryptocurrency is, is worth its weight in, in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and gold. Uh, I just, you, you need to see the stuff that he's doing under the paid side of the service, which is anything that involves prices and trades and things like that. You know, the macro like this, the big broad picture and where I'm trying to really instigate that you go out and buy a certain stock. Um, we'll keep that on the free side, but you know, the trades, man, you, you've got to get in there with, with him and, and see what he's doing. Cause whether you're a swing trader or a position trader, right? I'm mostly a position trader. I measure most of my trades in quarters and years. Um, and he's mainly a swing trader measuring his trades in days and weeks. So whether you want short term with some of your money and long term with most of it, or you just want it all long term, um, you know, you're still going to get the price information that's important when it comes time to buy. Right. So even if you're not swing trading him, helping you find that very last spot. Right. So like last year, I put all these charts up that showed buy zones 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% below where prices were a year ago. And people were telling me I'm nuts. And now they're all there, right? You see all the charts, all the charts that came down. Um, and then right at the end, he can help you get, you know, these are two or three spots where you should be accumulating. It's a great system. Um, in any case, gold. I think we're at the point now and have been probably for a month where gold is a better thing to invest in than gold stocks. And you know that I pretty much started to get out of gold stocks what was it almost a year ago now, nine months. Um, I haven't been in them for a while. I've been waiting to buy Newmont Mining if there's ever a big S&P 500 correction. But at this point, I don't think I want to be overweight. So I'll just get some incidental um, Barrett Gold and Newmont through any funds that I own. I think that gold is really just a fantastic trading value now. There's a pretty high floor for it. So even if you suffer a correction trading it, you probably make it all back in your next trade and then some. If you're going to trade something, man, I think you trade some gold and some Bitcoin uh, with Shooter over at, at Fundamental Trends. Um, I will be putting some of those longer term trades uh, over at margin of safety. Uh, but I think that gold, I think, I think in the next two to three years will be 3000 from it's about 2000 now. And one of the things that's going to drive it and keep this in mind, we're going to have volatility for a while, the rest of this year, um, maybe only to around Labor Day or September, October, maybe fourth quarter ends up being real good. We'll see. I don't think trying to save the midterms is going to matter too much to the stock market. I think all they really care about is getting oil down by then. So I think the expectation that you see higher interest rates, uh, anything more than just a marginal amount is wrong. I believe that you're going to see the Fed um, raise less than what most of the consensus is out there because they did not cause this inflation. Anybody who tells you this is where Raw and I get on the wrong page from each other, it, and, and I've been right for 10 years and he's been wrong. Um, so has Gunluck been wrong for 10 years? All these guys who are dollar bears, they're just wrong. There's not a substitute for the dollar for transactions and for security. Ultimately, uh, the dollar does get stronger again. But in the short run, I think that the dollar probably 
gets just a little bit weaker. And that's because the Fed's not going to raise that much because they didn't cause the inflation. The price of oil caused inflation and the locked up supply chains. We already know the supply chains are loosening up. And at some point in the next year, probably by the end of this year, oil starts coming down a lot. Who was it was just talking about the price of oil? Um, I forget whose interview it was. If I'm watching it, whoever it was, was a big deal. I just don't remember their name. Um, oh, no. You know who it was? It was the CEO of Ametis, actually. He benefits from the price of oil being high, right? So they asked him, one of the analysts asked him in the interview yesterday, said, hey, what do you think of the market for oil? Where do you think it's going? And he said, look, the spike in the price of oil right now is temporary. And ultimately, oil is going to end up around $80 a barrel, which is what I said three, four years ago. $80 a barrel is the price that makes sense, a little lower, you know, whenever there's a slowdown. Why is that? It's because Saudi Arabia, which really is petroleum price oil, they needed around 80 to pay for all the things that they're trying to do there. So when they say to the president of the United States, look, we'll pump a little bit more, but we're not going to pump a lot more. It's because that's in their interest, right? It's in their interest to have the price of oil be around 80 because they have bills to pay. And it's in the interest of everybody else in the world not to want to have the price of oil at 80. So how do you fix that? You start to replace oil. It's that simple. And they're all going to double down. Europe's going to double down on that. The United States is going to double down on that. India is going to double down on that. China will eventually double down on it, um, even though, you know, they're, you know, they're causing a big shift in the oil market right now by taking Russian oil. And, and that's the thing that I think people have to understand there is Russia is not going to pump less oil. They're just going to sell it to China instead of Europe. OK, so there is a six month or nine month shift in, in changing how oil moves, you know such as life that's not that big of a deal to be honest with you so this price and the spike spike of oil is based on fallacy that there's going to be less oil and more demand and it's just not working that way the iea already projected that by the end of this year there'd be more oil supply than demand that's not going to change that's what's that's what's coming i've told you about conoco uh chevron uh exxon uh pioneer they're all drilling more and by the end of the year, the United States will be producing a record amount of oil again, uh, just barely. And if it's not at the record, which is like 19.1 million barrels, uh, they'll, they'll be really close. So you just have to think through how does this all work together and how it all works together is. If we don't all decide to hate each other and kill each other and, and work our way towards World War III, the other scenario, which is much more likely, is that supply chains become more robust they become more flexible. Clean energy starts to defray our dependence on oil and gas, and the world becomes a lot more secure uh, from an energy standpoint. So then the next issue becomes food. How do we become more secure from a food standpoint, or from a water standpoint? These are all solvable problems. Uh, I have talked about uh, urban ag agriculture, uh, aquaponics, um, all sorts of vertical farming Oh, probably for 15 years now, because we have a guy in Milwaukee who was a big deal in that. Uh, and over in Puerto Rico, uh, they have a company that's doing it as well. Food security is not hard to achieve. It just, it really isn't from a technology standpoint and from a can we do it standpoint. But what's hard about food security, uh, and, and really we, we don't have any shortages. We just have a hard time moving it around because we're, we're jerks. Um, you know, you have strong men all over the world who ask for aid and then they don't give it to the people. They keep it for themselves. Food security is actually got to be the easiest problem to solve. I mean, we have more than enough sunshine, right? So it just comes down to, okay, how do we more efficiently farm in an industrial method? You, you do it vertically. Built One of the buildings I want to build here uh, in Wisconsin uh, will have the entire south side of the building uh, open, open to the sun. So it'll just be a giant sheet of glass, uh, plexiglass, but all these things will get solved. And it's just a matter of, okay, as an investor, how do I do this? And again, the four step process, identify the secular trends. We know what the secular trends are. All we have to do is invest with them. And if we're smart, um, we use the technical indicators to get us in at good prices after we've identified, you know, your government policy and is this particular company strong financially? I'm going to leave you with one thing here. 
and this is going to be the theme next, uh, not next week, Monday, but the following Monday, is that the SPACopolis, right? It's the uh, apocalypse for SPACs is basically over. If you've been watching some of our companies, they've performed pretty well here lately. Um, they've all had their final dive here at the end of 2021, very early in 2022. Now they're all holding up. And if you've been watching the revenues of really all of these companies that we picked out, they're all hyper growth. I mean, they're all growing 20, 30%, some of them 50%, and that's just going to keep happening. The satellite is a service tax. You need to own the whole basket. I don't know which one or two are going to be 10 baggers, and I don't know which one or two are going to merge, and I don't know which one or two are going to get bought out altogether by like a Google or something, but that's coming. Same thing with communication stocks that aren't SPACs, right? So you got Discovery, you got Paramount, you got Comcast. The M&A there is going to happen. It's already happening. The deal with Discovery is, is going down. Somebody asked about what happens to your options. They just get split up and reassigned proportionally. Um, you really, you know, if you don't own Discovery and AT&T right now, you need to go out and buy them because AT&T is going to get revalued up about two to three X over the next couple of years. And it's going to keep paying a four or 5% dividend uh, probably dips right after the um, spinoff and discovery. If you watch their bond deal this week, you know, they raised all the money that they needed to complete this deal in minutes, $30 billion. So it's the fifth biggest deal ever. They had subscriptions for 106 billion, 106 billion. So, you know, there's no shortage of liquidity out there yet. And the Federal Reserve is just not going to kill the golden goose. Yeah, I, I, I think they're getting most of what they want right now in the correction. And they're going to see it through a little bit further. Let those large caps come down. Let the market reset when the large caps, right, when the mega caps are finally down, you know, 20 to 30 percent. That's it. That's the end of the bear market. You know, we've had half of the stock market's been in a bear market for a year. A lot of it followed suit at the end of last year and the start of this year with Ukraine. That's it. You know, when Google, Amazon, Microsoft, NVIDIA, when all these stocks are down 20 to 30%, that's it. That's the end of the correction. That could be soon. It could be the first half of this year, like Tom Lee suggested. Um, I don't know, but we'll keep an eye on it. In the meantime, you need to be accumulating all these other stocks that are beat to hell and not say, oh, but it could go down 5 or 10% more. Look, if you're a trader, then learn how to trade and trade right. If you're not a trader and four out of five of you shouldn't be because you don't have the time, then look for entries that you're going to be happy with in five years, three, four, five years. That's what you're looking for. And the stocks that I give you are not average stocks. They're not middle of the barbell stuff. I'm only investing in companies that I think on the dividend side to triple or more and on the growth side can be 5x to 10x. You know, and, and we don't need to be right about everything because if the ones that don't go up 3X and 5X and 10X just are kind of average. And then you sprinkle in, okay, yeah, we got that 10X or right. You know, we got nutrient tripled. Well, who thought a fertilizer stock three years ago or four years ago was going to triple? This guy did. Now I'm telling you, you can ride it up a little higher, but you ought to be trimming because it's not going to triple again, right? So as they get into a cycle where they need more CapEx, now all of a sudden their margins won't be as fat. So they're coming in at the, to the end of their cycle, not the beginning. Because as technology on the farming side makes it less uh, necessary to have fertilizer, you know, as we do other things with agriculture, and, and I'm really endeared to that because I've been following agriculture my whole career because I thought I was going to buy a farm and be a farmer. You know, Jim Rogers said, be a farmer. And I was like, well, okay, nah, I like my cushy job instead. I don't want to work that hard. But there's people out there that bust their back. And I tell you what, as they can use technology to bust their back less and produce more, they have bigger margins. Also, farming is pretty interesting, again, when you only have to buy half as much potash because you're using a more efficient system. And that's what's coming. So I'm not in love with Nutrien anymore. I thought the easy money has been made, or I do think the easy money's been made there. Can it drift higher? Can you trade it higher? For sure. But uh, if you still own it from four years ago, and I hope a lot of you do, I know I know some of you do, um, you know, I'll start trimming that one back because this Ukraine situation will end sooner than later. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got all that potash back on the market. And it's just a matter of how it gets moved around at this point because of sanctions. Ultimately, I think that the post-Putin era 
is almost upon us. I think he's going to claim victory here in Ukraine. He's going to cut a deal. He's going to say, look, I am not here to destroy them. I'm here to make sure that NATO doesn't get to my doorstep. I'm here to make sure that this is a, a, a neutral country on my, on my border um, so that I still have access to the Black Sea um, without any headaches. That's what's coming. And he's going to claim victory. And Ukraine is going to be independent. And if they do things smart, which is going to include not listening to the United States all the time, because they have to look at what's in their best interest, just like Saudi Arabia. Look, I don't like the people in Saudi Arabia anyway, either that run that country. However, you have to understand they're doing what's in their best interest. They want the price of oil higher so they can pay for their transition economically. Ukraine should do the same thing. They should become like a Switzerland between Russia and the West. That's what they should be trying to do. And what's the United States going to do if that's what they decide? Are we going to suddenly sanction Ukraine? Come on. So, I mean, I think that this is all something that resolves. Um, but in the short run, you know, the volatility is scary. It gets equated with risk, and it's not exactly risk. Last week, I was a little casual in how I talked about that. Volatility and risk are different. If you can use volatility, other people's emotions, to get less risky, higher return assets, then that's what you should be doing, right? It's kind of like the karate kid. Use, use his weight against them. And that's what you're doing when you use volatility to buy these assets. You're using the market's weight against itself. So when things get spiked down, you need to take a look at them. Square, PayPal, we may have just nailed the bottoms on Square and PayPal. So you, you, you should have those positions getting built. I mean, those are just outstanding companies. Um, everything else, too. All right. Let's have a, a good day. I'm going to go back to the... Um, Cool. So do we have any questions here? I'll give you a couple here. Let me uh, get to the chat. Where is the list of SPACs I own? Google SPACs. I just did a list about three months ago, but I named a bunch of them today and alluded to a lot of them today. I think there's nine SPACs that I own or is it 10? I'd have to take a look. I am still trying to get into uh, MP materials. Uh, th that thing acts very well. So when that short attack happened a while back and it got down to 30, 31, 32, man, that might have been the bottom. We'll see. I think we get it again um, on MP materials. Maybe we get low 30s one more time or mid 30s. And then you got to own it because we're getting really close to them getting over some milestones. <laughs> you know, the government is giving them money too. So companies where the government directly helps them, what can you say? That's, uh, that's usually a pretty good, uh, pretty good sign, right? Shooter uh, just talked about the uh, target on Nutrien, 106. Take half of it. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to trade higher, you can use calls. Is there a looming recession? Um, so I've talked about the possibility of stagflation uh, since uh, 2017 and 18, because I knew that the tax bills were bad tax bills. I don't think there's a recession unless we really, really screw up. Uh, it's going to be slower growth, though, and growth is going to head back down to the twos, just like inflation is going to head back down to the twos. You know, one thing that I saw, somebody was talking about how inflation would end the year at 10%. It's just wrong. It's just the wrong way to look at it. The Federal Reserve and central banks that causes inflation. This is, we know, we can see the stats. We know this is almost all oil. It's almost all oil. Oil will stop, come, will stop going up soon, and it'll start coming down shortly after that, probably by the end of summer. And then the year-over-year -year comps going into the end of the year, you're, you're going to start seeing a three-handle on inflation by the fourth quarter. And then this time next year, it's going to start sniffing under three, you know, 2.9, 2.8, 2.7. Just going to keep going down. So, you know, in my mind, transitory is a year or two. In the mind of most people, it's next week. And it's the wrong way to look at things. Transitory, because all the systems work on year-over-year -year comps, is one or two years. That's really what transitory is. And Powell didn't know how to explain that, so be it. But that's what it is. That's what you should know. And all these things are going to play out. I, I really think that when they do the build back better, and it's going to happen, because um, they cleared the debts. I mean, if you saw the bill this week, they cleared the debts by passing this one and a half trillion dollar budget. Now they can go and do build back better. And 
if he's really trying to be a politician and be smart about this, President Biden will add another B. It'll be the balanced Build Back Better. And if they do a balanced Build Back Better where they only spend what they're taking in in, in, in revenue from the corporate taxes and the surtaxes on the on eight, nine figure of people, it's a winner just across the board. And it's actually good for the dollar long term. Uh, but again, just remember, Fed's probably not going to raise as much as they say. And don't forget, we keep talking about this. I keep talking about this. They got a trillion dollars on the side for the repo market. That money's going to trickle in at some point, at least some of it. So don't think that the Fed is just going to abandon the market because they want the 80% correction. It's just not going to work that way. And if it does, we got bigger problems. So spend the rest of this year getting invested. I had you last year, right? Especially the second half of last year, accumulate cash. Trickle your money into investments as you get the opportunities the rest of this year. Yeah, so Shooter is staying almost no chance of recession this year, 20, 30% in, in coming years. Yeah, it, it, I, th I think the odds of recession are always 20 to 30% in the next couple of years. That's just how it's worked historically. But if we really do rebuild the world, right? I called it rebuild the world two years before Biden came along and called it build back better. If we rebuild the world in a more sustainable way over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to get all the growth we need. And then in the United States, they'll coincide with the millennials hitting all their peak earnings years in the, in the 2030s. I, I agree with uh, Tom Lee. I think we're really close to another long-term boom. Uh, not long-term expansion. It won't be go-go, right? It'll be smoother. It won't be as go-go as, you know, before the financial crisis, but it'll be smoother, longer, more endurable. And frankly, anybody in America who wants to work is going to get ahead. Every single person. It's either earned income credit at the low end and professionals. You know, I'm here in Phoenix and I've talked to a number of people from Intel, right? It's, it's the company that I'm making, put at the top of my list. There are so many people doing so many smart things. I was one of the guys at the pool yesterday. Uh, he is a, uh, a tech guy, you know, it's some kid, he's 28 years old, making $200,000 a year. He's like, yeah, when I, and when I actually know what I'm doing, I'll be making four or $600,000 a year. I'm like, geez, you know, so there's a lot of great work out there. And the United States is the arbitrage against the rest of the world. If the rest of the world does well, the United States does better. If the rest of the world doesn't do so well, we still do better. It, it's just, it's always worked that way. It's going to work that way for the rest of our lives. And, you know, hopefully everybody starts to catch up and it all ends up being like in Star Trek where money doesn't even matter anymore, you know, four, five, six generations out. Um, so if somebody asked about DocuSign. I told you the reason I didn't put it on my list. I said their growth is going to slow down because they're starting to have substitutes. And that's exactly uh, what happened. So, you know, I took them off the plug and play. They're still on the very short list to watch. Uh, I do still think they're a buyout target. And now that they fell, now that now they're interesting. Now that they're interesting, um, I'll dig back into them and I'll figure out what the m and might look like. But I do think DocuSign gets bought. Um, Microsoft and Google are probably the the two companies that would bid on them um, or just replace them with their own technology because it's not that hard to copy. I've been using DocuSign for 15, 16, 17 years because they were in the financial industry years ago. Um, and we use them with TD Ameritrade on their platform. So they're not brand new. Hyper growth, I think, is over and there's substitutes um, and there's competition. So it's just a matter of what do you think the M&A value is on that company? I haven't looked at it that closely, but that is why we you know, I stopped focusing on them. They got some things coming. Zoom, on the other hand, I think Zoom is in a much stronger position because of their cloud technology. Look what we're doing right now. Um, and I think the Zoom is going to be a big deal. Uh, I still think that you want to be buying Zoom at these prices. All right. Is that it? Can I go back to the hot tub? Yeah. All right. Let me see how this looks. There we go. All right. Everybody have a good rest of the weekend. I'll be back on Monday. I don't know if I will be able... There you go, handsome dog. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to get the small caps done this weekend, but you know who they are. So just take a look at the plug and play and focus on satellite stocks uh, and a few of the other ones, uh, including MP. We got to figure out a way to get back into that. All right, have a good, good rest of the day.